The story of Johnny Appleseed awed many young children as they heard it. An American pioneer credited with introducing apple trees from Pennsylvania to Canada and Illinois to modern-day West Virginia. Teachers painted pictures in young minds of a barefoot adventurer with a pot for a hat traveling the countryside, leaving a trail of apple trees and oratory as his legacy. As odd as it may seem, I kept thinking of him, wondering what he might have thought of what I was seeing as I wandered the desolate Xanadu in South Georgia, known as the Okie Fanoki Swamp. Being half the size of Rhode Island, the Okefenokee is the largest blackwater swamp in North America. How can you describe this place of so many extremes? It's huge, vicious, majestic, and absolutely mysterious. Things under the water often shape and deeply affect those things that are above reflecting on the water's surface. The near 700 square miles of the Okefenokee fills a sandy depression that begins near Waycross, Georgia and spreads about 25 miles wide and 40 miles south into Florida. More than 90% of the wetland has been designated as the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. Dozens of creeks and streams feed the wetland that may look to the casual observer as a stagnant pool of water. Add to that runoff, an average rainfall of about 60 inches a year, which provides almost all of the water in the swamp. Then about 80% of that evaporates back into the atmosphere. What's left drains mainly into two waterways. The St. Mary's River gets about 11% of the water, taking it to the Atlantic Ocean along the Georgia-Florida border. The remaining 85% drains into the Sewanee River about one million gallons every two minutes, which makes its way across northern Florida to the Gulf of Mexico. The water is dark, flowing across a deep bed of leaves and decomposing plant material, filling it with tannic acid. That decomposing plant matter creates a dark color, while the tannic acid lowers the pH levels in many places to between 3.1 and 4.8 that makes it almost as acidic as vinegar. A pH reading of seven is neutral. That decomposing plant material creates the peat soils in this deep water marsh. That peat on the swamp bottom can be up to 15 feet thick, but it averages five to 10 feet in most areas. And that didn't happen overnight. It takes about 50 years to create a single inch of peat. It was mesmerizing to traverse the glass-like canals reflecting the majesty of the landscape. Then you could turn around and see the small propeller pushing your boat along at a snail's pace was stirring up the peat. The pressure of the prop wash released bubbles from the swamp floor, bubbles of methane, another byproduct of the peat freckling the water's surface. When the first humans chased mammoths, mastodons, and prehistoric camels across the southeast more than 10,000 years ago, geologists believed there was no Okefenokee swamp. Scientists believe the wetland is about 7,000 years old. The earliest recorded inhabitants were the Yakoni, who lived on the east side of the wetland. About 70 years after the Spanish established St. Augustine in today's Florida, they built the Santiago de Yakoni Mission, perhaps about 30 miles northeast of today's Folkestone, Georgia. The Spanish wanted to convert the Timucua-speaking Oconis to Christianity. The Oconis were skilled boaters in the swamps, so they were hired by the Spanish to ferry them through the Okefenokee. Tour guides say it's easy to get lost here. The landscape is constantly changing. For example, when we went out on the August night as Tropical Storm Fred passed to the west, one of the trails we were trying to navigate was cut off by a huge peat bog that had floated across it. About 12 hours later, when we went back out to that same area, the bog was gone and the trail was clear. There are almost 70 islands within the swamp, forested with pine and hardwood hammocks. 
Some people saw the timber and decided they could tame the wetland. The Sewanee Canal Company bought the land from the state of Georgia in 1891 and dug a 12-mile canal into the eastern prairies, trying to drain the swamp. They thought clearing out the water would make it easier to log the timber. The plan didn't work. Loggers returned with a vengeance in the early 1900s. Charles Hebert and his family bought the former Sewanee Canal Company holdings and built a series of railroad beds into the bayou. Billy's Island, located about 10 miles into the marsh, reportedly became a bustling town of 600 people with a sawmill, general store, schools, churches, hotels, and even a theater. The Hebert family companies and their subcontractors logged deep into the major timbered areas for almost 20 years. At its peak, more than 2,000 workers were in the swamp, cutting and processing timber. Major lumber operations ended in 1927 after cutting more than 423 million board feet of mostly cypress timber. Most of the virgin forest was now gone. Two years later, the Great Depression began. The family sold the Okefenokee to the U.S. government in 1937 and it became a federal animal refuge. A century later, the rusting and rotting remnants of that timber era still litters some of the swamp's islands. Fire is an essential element of the marsh's ecology. Strangely, all that timber had grown in the Okefenokee despite wildfires that have burned the swamp repeatedly ever since it formed. A well-placed lightning strike can ignite that methane mentioned earlier and start a wildfire. The first recorded fires were in 1840. There were huge blazes in 2007 and 2011, likely fueled by drought conditions. A 20 to 30 year cycle of drought and fire has allowed the Okefenokee to exist as the unique wetland it is. How does that happen? The wildfires keep the hardwood growth in check and allow the wetlands to remain wet. Those really hot wildfires can burn deep, sometimes deep into the peat beds, opening up large areas for new prairies and even lakes within the swamp. It's nature giving the Okefenokee new life. While they burn, birds fly elsewhere. Other animals seek refuge in the less flammable areas. Alligators move to deeper waters. A five-mile-long earthen dam was built in the early 1960s to control the water flowing into the Sewanee River as an effort to reduce the wildfires. But they still happen. And that peat is some incredible stuff. The ever-present tie tie or silver lacy bushes, and even trees, grow in it. Animals perch on it. Legend has it, when the early Creek Indians walked on it, they felt it shudder beneath their feet, so they called this place the Land of Trembling Earth, or Okefenokee in their language. And some argue that Oka means water in the Creek language, and Finoki means shaking. They contend the meaning of Okefenokee is closer to water shaking. Whatever it means, hundreds of animal species and an even greater number of plant species call it home. And many of them are predators. As the lily pad blooms were opening around 9 a.m., the wetlands were coming alive. An estimated 400 black bears wander throughout the refuge. They are efficient swimmers, and apparently they like a good back scratching. Otters, bobcats, and deer also wander the swamp. Almost a dozen different species of eagles, hawks, and falcons roam the refuge, watching for potential prey well camouflaged by the tree foliage. Turkey vultures and black vultures with their raspy hisses and grunts lie in wait for the scraps of the predator's hunts. But the black vulture's diet doesn't end there. They'll also eat eggs of other birds, turtles, lizards, and may even kill and eat the young birds or larger mammals. 
There are almost two dozen different kinds of frogs and toads that populate the region. They are the Michael Bublés of South Georgia, filling the Okefenokee nights with their song. Screech owls, great horned owls, and barred owls prowl the swamp looking for vermin, birds, frogs, and other prey. The Spanish moss that drapes the wetland in a curtain of curlicues contains another fascinating story. Unlike the way it looks, this bromeliad, a cousin of the pineapple, is not a parasite on the plant it covers. It has no roots attached to its host plant. It's just there, hanging in all its twisted glory. Spanish moss blows across the southeastern states, hanging on whatever catches it. As an epiphyte or air plant, it has scaly leaves that catch water and nutrients in the air. It also manages to catch ticks, spiders, and red bugs that make it their home. The reddish-black core of the plant is quite strong. Early natives used it to temper their pottery. Later, settlers processed it in moss gins. In 1939, the fibers became a $2.5 million cash crop that was spun into things like blankets, baskets, ropes, and pillows. Birds also use it to build their nest. We visited a rookery of birds along the canal filled with nests of egrets, wood storks, ibis, herons, and bitterns. It's a real trick raising their young in this thicket of bushes and trees. Any eggs or hatchlings that fall out of the nest are quickly gobbled up by the alligators waiting in the water below. While wood storks live in the Okefenokee Swamp, they've basically been pushed there over the years. They mostly lived in South Florida until their habitats were cleared for development and the Everglades were drained to about 50% of the size of 150 years ago. That's when the flocks of wood storks began to migrate north. They can now be found as far north as South Carolina, wandering shallow fish-filled waters and soaring the thermals with their wingspans of up to six feet. There are two types of sandhill cranes making their home in the swamp. The Florida sandhill cranes are there year-round. The greater sandhill cranes winter in the wetland from the beginning of November until early February. Early in the morning, the cranes join the cacophony of animals greeting the sun. It is quite the concert. Singing bass in this animal opera is the alligator. There is an estimated 10 to 13,000 alligators in the Okefenokee. Once you start seeing them and realize you are only seeing a small number of them, those numbers can seem like a huge underestimation. During the summer months, almost everywhere you see water, you'll see either an alligator or a patch of methane bubbles they've managed to stir up in the peat. They are the apex predator of the swamp. But it was not that long ago, hunting nearly drove the American alligator to extinction. They were placed on the endangered species list in 1967, and 20 years later, the recovery efforts had regenerated their population. Now off the list, an estimated 5 million gators are spread across the southeastern U.S. from southern Florida, across Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas. That's a habitat covering more than 400,000 square miles. In the Okefenokee, they can be found swimming across the water, hiding with only their eyes and nose above the water line, submerged in the vegetation or basking in the sun. Being ectothermic creatures, alligators become very slow during the winter months. But as the days heat up and summer arrives, they soak up the sun and reach their most active behaviors. 
Typically, they can stay submerged up to 20 minutes, but they can stay underwater up to two hours while resting. And when the water is really cold, they've been known to stay under for up to eight hours. One ranger from the Stephen C. Foster State Park located inside the Federal Wildlife Refuge compared alligators to solar panels. Those rough ridges along their backs are called scoots. These bony structures are filled with blood vessels, and as their blood circulates through this area, it is warmed like a solar panel giving them their incredible energy. Alligators have amazing speed, moving as fast as 35 miles an hour, lunging at prey, leaping as high as five feet into the air, and they can deliver a bite with a pressure of almost 3,000 pounds per square inch. That's second in the animal kingdom only to the crocodile. Their teeth are designed to grip prey, not rip or chew flesh like other predators. They digest their food, bones and all, in their gizzards. They are also among the first reptiles known to use tools. Sometimes they'll balance sticks and branches on their heads, luring birds looking for nesting material toward them. If they take the bait, the birds become dinner. And when I say they were everywhere, I mean everywhere. This is a nighttime video of the boat launch basin at the state park. Those dots you see moving are reflections from alligator eyes. You can count more than 50 gators floating around in the dark here. While driving from Folkestone to Fargo, there was even a little one on the highway that had become roadkill. Naturalists warn, where there are little ones, expect mama to be nearby until they are perhaps three years old. Alligators, turtles, eels, and two-toed amphiuma prowl below the mirrored surface of the swamp. The dark waters camouflage the hunters, allowing them to surprise their prey. And all the hunters in the park aren't animals. Carnivorous plants that grow above the waterline include hooded pitcher plants, blue butterworts, and sundews. They grow on islands in peat bogs, gobbling up insects they trap. Swollen bladderwort lives beneath the water's surface, snatching prey like mosquito larvae at lightning-fast speeds of up to one-thirtieth of a second. It's a vast land prone to wildfires filled with deadly predators. Some worry all of it is threatened by development. A highly controversial mining operation has been proposed near the swamp for decades. Until 2020, the proposed mine, less than three miles from the refuge, was blocked by the Clean Water Act. Now plans are underway to mine for titanium and zirconium just southeast of the refuge. The Okefenokee is constantly changing. It remains one of the most outstanding examples of an ecologically intact swamp in North America. The change in seasons brings different touches of beauty as the refuge foliage changes. The natural beauty is spellbinding, while the mysteries of the Okefenokee are breathtaking.